This is a revision video about the GCSE chemistry topic of polymers. This actually covers material from Unit 2, Unit 7 and Unit 10 of AQA GCSE Chemistry or Combined Science. In the first part of this video, we're going to define what we mean by a polymer, describe the structure of a polymer, explain why polymers are solid at room temperature and name some polymers from their monomers. This is all combined science content from Unit 2. In the latter part of the video, we're going to look at some material from Unit 7 and Unit 10, which only applies to you if you're taking triple science. I'll try and make it really clear where this is happening. So from Unit 7, we're going to look at addition and condensation polymers, and from Unit 10, we're going to look at the properties of different types of polymers. Polymers are very long chains of repeating units called monomers. Each monomer isn't a single atom, it's actually a small molecule in its own right, which is then joined up to other small molecules of the same type to form one very long chain. It's really important for the GCSE exams that you remember this word very, as without it you won't be given the mark. Each monomer is joined to the next monomer by a strong covalent bond, so one polymer chain might contain thousands of strong covalent bonds. In between the chains, there is a weak intermolecular force. The same weak intermolecular force that we would find between two molecules of oxygen or two molecules of nitrogen. As we've already seen, the larger a molecule is, the stronger its weak intermolecular forces are. So even though polymers are only held together by this weak intermolecular force, because they are such very, very large molecules, they're actually usually solids at room temperature. In order to name a polymer, we look at the names of its monomers. So for instance, if the monomer was pentene, the polymer would be polypentene, which just means lots of pentene. Likewise, if the monomer were hexene, the polymer would be called polyhexene. Here's an opportunity to pause the video and make sure that you've understood this. Remember, if ethene is polymerized, it makes polyethene. So can you write down the names of these five polymers? When propene makes a polymer, it's called polypropene. When butene makes a polymer, it's called polybutene. When octene makes a polymer, it's called polyoctene. When styrene makes a polymer, it's called polystyrene, which I hope you've heard of. And when vinyl acetate makes a polymer, it's called polyvinyl acetate. In other words, PVA, the stuff that glue is made out of. You also need to be able to identify that a substance is a polymer based on diagrams. Here we can see a displayed formula for part of a polymer. We can see that it's a polymer because it has the same repeating unit occurring again and again. But obviously drawing this out is going to take a really long time, so instead we tend to use a shorthand. Within the brackets is the repeating unit of the polymer, the part that we're going to see happening again and again and again. The lines coming out of the brackets signify the fact that each one of those carbon atoms is making another bond, we're just not drawing the whole molecule. The N represents any very large number. It's not important whether there are 100 or 200 of these repeating units, it's still going to be a polymer. If you see this diagram in the exam, they're asking you to identify that the material is a polymer. The next few slides are only relevant if you're taking GCSE chemistry or what we sometimes call triple science. So if you're taking GCSE combined science or if you're just wanting to revise unit two and not anything from unit seven or unit 10, stop watching now. For unit seven, you need to be able to identify whether polymers are going to be addition polymers or condensation polymers. I know that this monomer is going to make an addition polymer because addition polymers are made out of one type of monomer with one functional group a double bond in the middle of the monomer. When a polymerization reaction occurs, that double bond is going to break, allowing each of the two carbon atoms to form a new bond to another monomer on either side. Here we can see the same repeating unit happening again and again and again, joined together by strong covalent bonds between each monomer. We can also draw the same polymer using that same shorthand that we just looked at. In contrast to this, a condensation polymer requires monomers with two different functional groups. This could either be two separate monomers, each with one functional group, as is the case when you make a polyester, or it could be one monomer which has two different functional groups, like these amino acids. The important thing about condensation polymerization is that when the monomers react together and form a bond, there is a small molecule lost. So both here and in the formation of polyesters, it's a water molecule. 
You may be asked in the exam to identify what small molecule has been lost, but if you look at the pictures of the monomers and then you look at the picture of the polymers, whichever atoms haven't been included must be in the molecule that's been lost, and it is usually water. Unit 7 also includes a number of different examples of naturally occurring polymers. These include DNA, where you should know that it has a double helix structure and that the monomers that make it up are four complementary nucleotides. Proteins made from amino acids, like this glycine molecule here, and here you should be aware that they do have these two different functional groups, the carboxylic acid group on the right, which is red, and the amine group on the left, which is blue, and then also starch and cellulose, which are both made out of glucose. When we return to polymers in Unit 10, it's to discuss their physical properties. So this could be something like melting point, flexibility, density, or tensile strength. Polymers made out of different monomers are going to have different properties because they're fundamentally different materials. So polyethene and polypropene don't have the same melting point. But we can also influence these physical properties by changing the reaction conditions, by forming the polymer at a different temperature, under a different pressure, or by using a different catalyst. Let's look at an example. Polyethene is a really common, really useful plastic, and there are two main types, low-density polyethene, or LDPE, and high-density polyethene, or HDPE. Low-density polyethene is made under incredibly high pressure and pretty high temperature too, with a tiny bit of oxygen in there to function as a catalyst. When the polymer forms, it makes branches, and those branches stop the chains from packing too closely together. In contrast to that, High-density polyethene is made under relatively low pressure, maybe only 10 atmospheres as compared to 1,000, and a slightly lower temperature, probably about 100 degrees C, with a kind of catalyst called a ziegler natta catalyst. When it forms, the polymer chains get into these really regular rows that pack tightly together, and so the final polymer is much harder and much denser. Now, completely separately from that, you need to know about thermosetting and thermosoftening polymers. And I really want to emphasize that this is a completely different part of the specification. Lots of the time people end up getting confused and thinking that the crosslinks in thermosetting polymers are the same thing as the branches in LDPE, and they're not. So thermosetting polymers, if you look at them on a molecular level, kind of look like a wonky brick wall. They have crosslinks between the chains, and these crosslinks are just covalent bonds those covalent bonds will stop the chains from moving past each other. This is exactly the same idea as if you think back to unit two and diamond, and the fact that diamond is really hard because all of the atoms have got four strong covalent bonds, and so they can't move at all. So here our chains can't move past each other. And so that means that if you heat them, they don't melt, they just stay strong until eventually they burn and char. In contrast to that, thermosoftening polymers don't have crosslinks. And so they just melt, which obviously means they're no good for functions like insulating something that will get very hot, like kitchenware, because even a small amount of thermal energy is enough to overcome the weak intermolecular forces between layers. It's also worth pointing out here that if you do a design and tech subject, they use some different words for thermosoftening polymers, like thermoforming, and those aren't credit worthy in a science exam. You need to use the word thermosoftening. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you found that a useful summary of all the polymer content in GCSE Chemistry. If you did find it useful then don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCSE Chemistry videos coming soon.